By the way, how bad were the Academy Awards this year? Did you see? And the winner is a movie from South Korea. What the hell was that all about? We got enough problems with South Korea with trade. On top of it, they give him the best movie of the year. Was it good? I don't know. You know, I'm looking for like, where, where? Let's get Gone with the Wind. Can we get like Gone with the Wind back, please? Sunset Boulevard. So many great movies. The winner is from South Korea. I thought it was best foreign film. Best foreign movie. No, oh, where's the button? Did this ever happen before? 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 Welcome back to Gibchard. We began this episode with a quote from Donald Trump about the movie Parasite. Now, if a former, perhaps future, president of the United States is talking about South Korean cinema, then we know that a cultural shift is in effect. What we're interested in today is thinking about how we got here and where we might go next. What can the past of South Korean cinema tell us about its possible future? As the historian E.H. Carl once wrote, while history never repeats itself, it presents certain regularities and permits of certain generalizations, which can serve as a guide to future action. What Carr was saying is that while past events can't exactly predict the future, by studying the similarities between them, we can make a pretty decent stab at it. That observation is our jumping off point as we go back, way, way back, into the history of South Korean cinema. In the 21st century, South Korean films are among the most critically and commercially successful in the world. The triumph of Parasite at the 2020 Oscars was proof enough of that, but the Korean wave, or Hallyu, had been building for some time. I feel like a very opportune moment in history is happening right now. We can trace the beginnings of the Hallyu to 1994, when the government restructured the nation's film industry. Since then, numerous South Korean films have enjoyed crossover success outside East Asia. Titles like Joint Security Area, A Tale of Two Sisters, Old Boy, Three Iron, The Host, I Saw the Devil, Snowpiercer, Train to Busan, The Handmaiden, The Villainess, and Burning are beloved of film Twitter users and normal people alike. Although these films differ in subject matter and tone, they all demonstrate the boundless ambition of their creators. They are works at the cutting edge, with a transgressive spirit setting them apart from the increasingly conservative output of Hollywood. The other thing those films have in common? As we can see here, they are all from the last 20 years, which reflects the emphasis that successive South Korean governments have placed on cultural soft power. But let's look at it another way. What about the years before? Was nothing going on until 2000? The answer to that might surprise you. Although the 70s to the early 90s was a fallow period, the same couldn't be said of the 50s and 60s, which have been called a golden age for the country's film industry. For about a decade and a half, film production increased dramatically, rivaling Japan or Hong Kong. Directors like Han Hyung Mo released hugely popular films in mainstream genres, while others like Yu Hee and Mok were lauded at international film festivals. You might say that South Korea was one of the most critically acclaimed and commercially successful film industries anywhere in Asia, if not the world. But now, now the golden age is a footnote in retrospectives of South Korean cinema. On Letterboxd, for example, this film, Kim Ki Young's mordant thriller, The Housemaid, is the only one that's been logged more than 10,000 times. And that's largely because it was released in the Criterion Collection, Every Cheers movement. Marty, and one of only four South Korean films in the collection, and the only one from before 2000. 
So one of the issues here is that these films aren't that easy to find, unless you know where to look. It's not just a problem in the West either. In South Korea itself, the National Film Archive didn't preserve classic cinema until 1994. Two years later, in 1996, a South Korean TV channel asked viewers to choose the films that audiences wanted to see again. Out of 100 entries, there was just one homegrown film, way down at number 74, M. Kwon Taek's Sopyeonje from 1993, shown here. The rest of the list was all Hollywood blockbusters. Based on this showing, it was as if the country had no film heritage to speak of. So, what happened? How did this powerhouse film industry disappear, almost without trace? Over the course of several parts, I'm going to give an answer to that question. In this part, we'll look at the social and political background to the Golden Age and see how the film industry was rebuilt after the devastation of the Korean War. In the next part, we'll look at a couple of classic films, as well as the ways that political struggles in the late 50s affected their production. That should follow next month, after which we'll take a longer break before returning to look at the peak of the Golden Age in the 60s and its decline in the early 70s. But just now, let's begin at the beginning. The 16th century, to be exact. Welcome to the Golden Age. Raymond Williams once wrote that the art is there as an activity with the production, the trading, the politics, the raising of families. His point was that art isn't separate to society, but just one of many activities that constitute it. Now, there isn't time for me to talk about the production, the trading, or the raising of families, but we should establish some basic facts about the politics of South Korea in the 1950s. Relations between the government and the film industry are crucial to understanding how the Golden Age well, how the Golden Age got golden. To begin, let's go back 500 years. During the 16th century, Korea's Joseon Kingdom was at the peak of its power, even holding off an invasion by the powerful Japanese army. When we move forward to the 20th century, however, we find the nation struggling to come to terms with modernity. At this moment of uncertainty, the Japanese invaded once again, successfully this time. Their annexation of Korea marked the beginning of four decades of colonial rule. Conditions were harsh under the Japanese. Koreans were used as surplus labour in industries that profited the imperial state, not Korea itself, most notoriously as comfort women for the Japanese army. However, in March 1919, an estimated 2 million Koreans fought back, participating in pro-independence protests across the country. This came to be known as the March 1st Movement, which was the initial focus of resistance against the imperial government. The March 1st Movement had a clear aim, but over time it splintered. Different groups had different visions of an independent Korea, would it be capitalist? Would it be communist? The eventual first president of South Korea, Sing Man Rhee, identified with the conservative elements of the movement. But really, he was more interested in chasing clout. Rhee, seen here as a young man, spent those terrible decades of Japanese rule in the United States. What was he doing there? Well, he was networking. His contacts in the US government came in handy when the position of President of South Korea was created in 1948. The US Office of Strategic Services recommended him for it since, in their estimation, he shared the American point of view. Their judgment was put to the test in the five years 
after Korea's independence. When the Japanese withdrew in 1945, the superpowers occupied the Korean peninsula, eventually dividing it between North and South. Ri outmaneuvered his political opponents and was installed as leader of the southern half of Korea, now known as the Republic of Korea. Eager for a confrontation with the Communist North, now led by the guerrilla fighter Kim Il-sung, Ri and the Americans increased tensions at the border, eventually triggering a war in 1950. The Northern Army, backed by Russian and Chinese forces, appeared on the brink of victory within a few months. However, the US Army, led by General Douglas MacArthur, staged a remarkable comeback at the Battle of Incheon in September 1950, and after that, the war settled into a stalemate. An armistice was eventually signed in 1954, establishing the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea and freezing both countries in a permanent war footing. In the South, the death toll was massive and the loss of infrastructure almost catastrophic, as these figures reveal. The story was similar in the North, but the support of the Communist bloc ensured a speedy reconstruction. By contrast, in the South, the Americans willfully slowed a potential recovery by continuing to support Re. The elderly dictator funneled US aid money into the pockets of his cronies and, perhaps understandably, refused to trade with the Japanese, even though they were the South's closest potential trading partner. The result of American action in South Korea was a country gripped by dire poverty. In the rural provinces, that triggered a wave of migration to the cities. The resulting increase in the urban population proved to be unsustainable. Water shortages became common. Men and women lingered on the streets looking for work or American cigarettes they could resell. And for most people, housing was a shack built out of whatever junk was lying on the streets. All of this created a feeling of extreme uncertainty that South Koreans called Puran. The Americans were not pleased about this state of affairs. South Korea was pivotal to US plans for the region, as we can see from this map of American military bases in the Republic. Those plans were threatened by the prospect of widespread social discontent, perhaps leading to a revolution, and then, who knows, an invasion from the North. The White House considered pushing the Guatemala button and removing Ri from power, but disagreement within the American bureaucracy, not to mention the lack of a capable politician to replace him, stayed their hand. Ri would remain, and so the Americans would have to work around him to stop a revolution. In the short term at least, that meant conditions in South Korea would continue to deteriorate. And that was the case throughout society, including the film industry. We like to think that great art comes out of adversity, but that idea often obscures the real relationship between culture, society, and politics. To take a more recent example, the Hallyu was the result of a deliberate plan begun in 1994 of reorganization and investment. This was initially directed by the government, but quickly drew an investment from multinational chaballs as well as independent producers. Their involvement meant that when the 1997 IMF crisis hit South Korea and the government adopted austerity measures in the economy, the film industry was largely insulated from the shock. Working at a remove from the economic downturn, directors like Park Chan-wook were able to explore artistically challenging themes in films like Old Boy. That film certainly reflected adversity, but only because it was made in a specific cultural and economic context that allowed for artistic expression. By comparison, 
The film industry during the early part of the Golden Age was directly plugged into the Cold War economy that the United States enforced on South Korea. It was difficult, deliberately difficult, for filmmakers to free themselves from the network of institutions that the Americans established to control cultural production. The effect was to restrict artistic freedom and prevent the kind of critical, even radical films that South Korea is currently known for. So while there was certainly adversity during the 1950s, there wasn't much great art. In the next part, we'll explore the relationship between South Korean cinema and American power in more detail. The Golden Age emerged out of conditions that one American observer described as a handicraft operation. The Americans were able to take advantage of this in order to impose their own structure on the South Korean film industry and thereby control almost all of the nation's cultural output. In this part, we'll take a look at how they achieved that. Before 1956, it was almost impossible to make a film in South Korea. The end of Japanese rule, followed by the outbreak of the Korean War, made access to modern equipment, studio space or processing laboratories difficult. Those directors who were active during the period had to make do with cast-off cameras bought on the black market or disused film reels left behind by one occupier or another. A handful of films from this period are watchable enough, like the film seen here, 1949's A Hometown in Heart, but on the whole they look primitive compared to the ones that were coming out of Japan at the same time. The Americans sought to remedy that situation, but naturally they had an ulterior motive. To turn South Korea into an anti-communist bulwark, they spent much time and money on shaping its culture to ensure that supportive voices were protected and nurtured while dissenting voices were shut out and left to wither away outside the system. They did this in three ways. Number one, by providing training and resources. In the colonial era, the Japanese trained then employed Koreans in the production of pro-imperial propaganda films. One such film, commenting metatextually on cooperation between Japanese and Korean filmmakers was 1941's Spring in the Korean Peninsula. Japan's defeat at the end of the Second World War and its subsequent departure from Korea turned out to be a net loss for the Korean film industry. It was left without financing or resources and eventually came to depend on American support. Initially, this was advanced by the United States Information Service, USIS for short. USIS funded propaganda during the Korean War and hired South Koreans to direct it. One alumni was Han Hyung Mo, who went on to make some of the biggest films of the 1950s. For him, USIS not only offered steady work, it also exposed him to modern facilities and equipment. The experience caused a change in his thinking about cinema, and after the war, he tried to build his own version of Hollywood outside Seoul. The Americans, therefore, reshaped attitudes as well as working practices. Number two, by providing money. Lots of money. South Korea's stubbornly low rate of economic growth meant that the Americans had to pony up throughout the decade. While most of that aid money went into the pockets of his cronies, occasionally President Rhee spent it on industries he considered vital, including the film industry. In 1954, he removed tax on cinema tickets for domestic films, but whacked it up to 95% for foreign ones. Investment boomed as a result, with a major growth in studio complexes, production companies and cinemas by the end of the decade. Rhee took the credit, but without US aid, it would never have happened. Number three, through international connections. 
These were facilitated by an organisation called the Asia Foundation. On the face of it, the foundation was benign enough, setting up trips for South Korean academics to visit the University of Minnesota, for example. The idea was to build bridges between nations, anti-communist nations, which was a common thrust of American foreign policy at the time. This discussion forum between students from various US-aligned nations was just one of the more visible manifestations of it. But behind the philanthropy, the Asia Foundation was controlled by the CIA, and it was used by them to direct the course of South Korean culture in America's favour. The Asia Foundation was keen on cinema, calling it the most effective instrument for selling ideas. To boost the industry, it created a professional body called the KMPCA, then linked it to another initiative, the Asian Film Festival. The festival took place across East Asia during the late 50s, serving as a market for South Korean studios to sell films and organise lucrative co-productions with their counterparts in Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong and Malaysia. Membership also exposed directors to new trends in Japanese cinema, which was then at the peak of its international prestige. This encouraged the likes of Han to up their game, since more polished films had a better chance of making a profit overseas. In these three ways, the Americans put South Korean cinema on a productive footing. But they also created barriers, some deliberate, others inadvertent. For example, access to the Asian Film Festival depended on your perceived loyalties. If you were critical of capitalism, like director Kim So Dong, then it could damage your career. Kim's drama, The Money, was rejected as the South Korean entry to the festival in 1958 because, according to one official at the Ministry of Education, it showed the wretched, shadowy side of Korea. One of Han's films was sent instead, and after suffering that blow, Kim never directed again. The US subsidised tax cut created another barrier. It increased the wealth of cinema owners, who then reinvested their profits into the production of more films. But while that made sense from a business perspective, it was an obstacle for artistically inclined directors. The fact was, cinema owners weren't interested in films like The Money that took a more critical perspective on South Korean society. They wanted the sort of films that Han Hyung Mo made, comedies and melodramas that were guaranteed to sell tickets. In that way, the market restricted artistic expression, an outcome that was entirely consistent with the Asia Foundation's activities elsewhere in the film industry. The situation is different now. Although the Hallyu was the result of a deliberate plan to boost South Korean cultural exports, it was at least initiated by the South Koreans themselves. The report from the Presidential Advisory Board on Science and Technology, published in 1994, began the process of restructuring the film industry and removing some of the barriers for independent filmmakers. Cut, cut. One of the results of this restructure was a greater balance between commercial cinema and art house films. Perhaps more significant has been a blurring of the two categories. Parasite, for example, uses the narrative beats of a horror film to tell a story with an unmistakable political message. During the era of American hard power, it was much harder to create that kind of boundary-pushing cinema. After years of uncertainty in the film industry, most directors were glad of steady work, even if it meant colouring inside the lines. Which is not to say that the golden age was entirely without controversy. In fact, the first major success of the era, Han Hyung Mo's Madame Freedom, provoked media attention for its focus on a modern, liberated woman. But while the film was definitely near the knuckle, Han still found a way to make it acceptable in the repressive context of post-war politics. We'll look at Madame Freedom in part two, 
along with another important film from the re-era, Aimless Bullet. For now though, we'll leave it here. If you'd like to check out any of the films featured in this video, I've included links in the description below. Also, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. I don't upload content as frequently as I'd like to, but when I do, you'll be notified immediately, giving you plenty of time to reschedule any appointments, call in sick to work, or tell your loved ones that you'll miss them. Thank you for watching, and remember, support your local multiplex.